Five days after his initial visit, Samoset returned to Plymouth with four other Indians, including Squanto, who talked about his own time in Spain, Newfoundland, and London. They'd also brought furs to trade along with fresh herring. An hour later, Massasoit himself appeared on the hill across the creek. He was about 35, serious and quiet, with his face painted a dark red and wearing a wide necklace made of shell beads, as well as a long knife suspended from a string. He was surrounded by an entourage of about 60 warriors whose faces were painted in assorted colors and designs and who were holding bows and arrows. Squanto spoke with Massasoit and returned with the message that the pilgrims should send someone to speak with him. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvola, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. Winslow's wife was dying, but he agreed to act as the messenger. He put on a suit of armor, walked alongside Squanto, and presented the sachem with a pair of knives, some copper chains, alcohol, and biscuits, and then delivered a brief speech, saying that King James of England saluted him with words of love and peace, and looked to him as a friend and ally. Carver wished to speak and trade with Massasoit, and hoped to establish a formal peace. Massasoit asked if Winslow was willing to sell his sword and armor, but Winslow politely declined. They decided that Winslow would remain with Massasoit's brother while the sachem went with 20 of his men unarmed to meet Governor Carver. In Plymouth, Brewster organized a reception for the Indian king. Standish led a delegation of six armed men to greet the sachem at the brook. They exchanged salutations and Standish accompanied Massasoit to a house in the town as the pilgrims welcomed him by playing a drum and trumpet. When he entered the house, Governor Carver kissed his hand, and he returned the gesture. They sat down, and Carver offered Massasoit a a ceremonial drink of liquor. Massasoit, however, was sweating in fear, especially when he saw the English English guarding their storehouse, which held the gunpowder. Massasoit and Carver negotiated an agreement for an alliance between their two peoples. According to the agreement, Massasoit's people wouldn't hurt the English, and if any of his subjects did hurt the English, Massasoit would send the offender to Plymouth to be punished. If any tools were taken, he would have them returned, and the English would reciprocate. If anyone made an unjust war against Massasoit, the English would help him. And if any Englishman harmed an Indian, they'd turn him over to the Poconokets. Massasoit would tell his neighbors about the peace agreement, so they'd be included in it, and both sides would agree to meet unarmed in the future. The pilgrims broke the last part of the treaty pretty quickly, continuing to carry their muskets throughout the meeting. Massasoit chose not to comment on this, but his brother did, and they put their muskets aside. They also decided that Squanto would stay with the English, and Massasoit said that he would plant corn near Plymouth, which he officially gave to the English as a gift. The pilgrims sent him a large kettle of peas as a gift, which he liked, and that night Squanto and Samoset spent the night with the English, while Massasoit and his men slept in the woods about half a mile away. They were officially at peace with Massasoit, a man allied with most of the region's tribes. It was a big step toward peace and security, though certainly not a final one. Some of Massasoit's allies had reservations about the move, trusting both the English and Squanto as little as Massasoit initially had. Massasoit also had enemies among the Narragansetts. Shortly after the agreement was reached, Christopher Jones returned to England. He left the rest of the Mayflower's beer with the pilgrims and drank water on the way home. 
Soon after returning, he died, and the Mayflower rotted in the river near his grave until it was useless and broken down for scrap. There's a barn in Buckinghamshire, which legend says was built from the ship's scrap, and which you can still see today. In England, unsurprisingly, Weston's finances were continuing to disintegrate, and now he didn't have the much-needed returns on his Mayflower investment. Jones had brought back no fish, no fur, and had dropped the passengers outside of their patent area, which meant that investors had to buy a new patent from the Council for New England, as well as raising funds to send over reinforcements and supplies, and they hadn't had an infusion of money. Weston was trying to recoup his Mayflower losses by by smuggling aluminum sulfate, or alum, which was a chemical used to fix dyes into woolen cloth. James had declared Yorkshire's alum mines to be an issue of national security, taken them for the, from their previous owners who weren't using them, and rented them out to people who would extract the chemical and pay him rent. To ensure that their business was profitable enough to sustain this plan, James banned European alum and set a minimum price of £26 a ton, for alum sold within England. The English alum sold for just £13 a ton in Europe, so a group of desperate merchants, including Weston, had started to buy English alum in Europe at a reduced price, and then smuggle it back into England to sell for £22 a ton. James found out what was happening and sent out an investigator, and that investigator found Weston and filed a lawsuit against him. Weston, of course, had bought on credit, and when he lost the lawsuit, others involved in the trade said that he was the person responsible for the smuggling, which made him alone liable for the court's heavy penalty of £345. He didn't help matters much when he offered, quote, willful contempt and abuse to the state, but to be honest, there really wasn't much he could have done to help matters at the time. The Council for New England was the revived Plymouth Colony, which James was encouraging to try to divert investors away from the Virginia Company, which he was planning to take over. It was led by the same person who had led the Plymouth Company, Ferdinando Gorges, Gorges was passionate about New England, but he himself drew strong criticisms of being an aristocrat and a feudalist. He saw colonization as an aristocratic endeavor, and he collected rents from everybody who lived in or did business in his patent area. This was deeply unpopular, especially coming from someone who did deal largely with Puritans, but was himself aristocratic. It's worth noting, though, that he did this largely so that he could afford to defend these areas from attack, especially from the Spanish, with whom he saw war as an inevitability. The Council for New England used the system of particular plantations to remain financially solvent, and in fact, in 1622, Gorges himself would partner with John Mason to buy a patent for a particular plantation, Maine. He was one of the 40 members of the new council, though, which would comprise a body politic that would vote on various issues. Other members' names will look familiar at this point. The Earl of Southampton, Cecil's son William, Buckingham, Francis Popham, Richard Hawkins, the Earl of Warwick, and his brother. It took two months to raise the money and send the second mission, A tiny ship called the Fortune, which would carry 35 new settlers, but no supplies or trading goods. They needed the Fortune to return to England as soon as possible, though, with beaver skins to help maintain the financial solvency of the investors and the colony. Back in Plymouth, Carver died, and his wife followed about five weeks later. A jarring winter was just ending, and the pilgrims were beginning to realize that the theft of the corn from the Nausets had damaged their ability to trade for fur or build an alliance with the tribe. 
On the bright side, Squanto was teaching them to plant corn, squash, and beans, and to fertilize the crops with the herring that was starting to fill the rivers. Still, Carver's death was a big blow at the end of a winter that had already killed half the settlers. The winter's hardship had also exacerbated tensions among the settlers. Hopkins' two servants had injured each other in a duel and been sentenced to have their heads and feet tied together, and Billington was continuing to oppose Standish's demands. They needed to replace Carver with someone who was reliable and respected, and Bradford was the natural choice. He'd been a part of Robinson's congregation since he was a young teenager after his parents had died, and he'd sold pretty much everything he had for the benefit of the colony. He was elected governor with Brewster, Winslow, Standish, and Allerton as his advisors. And soon, Winslow married Susanna White, both having been widowed over winter. Over spring, they planted, they fished, and by summer, they were at least recovering from the traumatic first few months. They did have a continual stream of Indian visitors asking for food, though. So in July, Winslow and Hopkins visited Massasoit at Namaskit and gave him a chain, which they said he should give to any of his subjects that he sent to visit Plymouth. They would only feed visitors who were carrying the chain, and that way they could be sure to feed the people sent by Massasoit without having to entertain every guest that came along. On their way, the Englishmen saw story holes, which Indians dug wherever major events had happened. Squanto told them stories of the past, the land as it used to be before the plague had set in. Two older Indians welcomed them into their home on the way to Namaskit, and they learned that the two 60-year-old warriors were the last survivors of a once-thriving village. Finally, they reached Massasoit's village of Soams, a beautifully fertile piece of land with two rivers running through it. By comparison, Plymouth was a wasteland. The sachem invited them into his wigwam, And in addition to the chain, they gave him a horseman's coat, which both he and his people loved to see him in, and he happily agreed to their requests. Then he gave a speech to each of his villages, saying that they should trade with the English and provide them with furs, and that the French would no longer be welcomed in their area. Because he named each village by name in the speech, The speech went on for a long time, and Winslow and Hopkins were torn between boredom and joy. There was no food in the village because the Poconokets had just arrived from their winter village, but they smoked, talked, and stayed overnight in Massasoit's house, sharing a sleeping platform with the sachem, his wife, two more warriors, and a bunch of lice, fleas, and mosquitoes. The Indians also sang themselves to sleep, which kept the Englishmen from sleeping. And the next day, they played games while Winslow and Hopkins gave a shooting demonstration with their muskets. With little food the next day and no sleep the next night, Winslow and Hopkins decided it was time to return home. Squanto would stay at Poconogut, though, to help establish trading relations between various villages and the pilgrims, which would provide the English with both furs and corn. In the meantime, Tokamahaman would serve as their guide, and two days later they returned to Plymouth, having successfully strengthened the friendship with the Indians to the west. Not long after Winslow and Hopkins returned to Plymouth, John Billington's teenage son Francis lost his way in the woods. He'd already found the giant lake, which served as the source of Town Brook. And they had named that the Billington Sea. This time, though, Billington got lost and wandered for five days living on nuts, roots, and anything else he could find. Until he stumbled into the Indian village of Manamit, about 20 miles east. The town sachem, Kanakum, turned him over to the Nowsets, who were still hostile to the English, and who were led by the sachem, Aspinet. 
Pilgrims didn't know what had happened to the Billington kid, but they learned from Massasoit that he was fine and living with the Nowsets. Bradford ordered a party of ten men, which was more than half of the adult males in the settlement, to set out in the shallop with Squanto and Tokamahaman as guides. As they sailed to Nowset, a thunderstorm forced them to take shelter for the night, and the next day they found themselves on tidal flats, surrounded by Indians collecting lobsters. Squanto and Tokamahaman went to speak with them, and they introduced the pilgrims to their sachem, Ieno. He was a twenty-something, personable, and courteous man. And while in the town, they also met a hundred-year-old woman who started crying when she saw them, saying that her kids had been, a, had been captured by Thomas Hunt several years before, and that she was still mourning their loss. They said they were sorry that an Englishman had given them that offense, that Hunt was a very bad person, and that all the Englishmen who had heard of his crimes condemned him too. Then they were approached by the man whose corn they had stolen, and they invited him to visit Plymouth, where they promised to reimburse him for his loss. Aspinet then brought Billington, well cared for and with a string of shell beads around his neck. The pilgrims gave Aspinet a knife and peace was declared between the English and the Nowsets. They had made peace with the tribe in the region that was most hostile to them, but it was the Nowset sachem who told them that they might now be at war with another tribe. The Narragansetts had killed several of Massasoit's men and taken the sachem captive. According to their treaty with Massasoit, they were obligated to go to war with the most powerful tribe in the region. The Narragansetts were easily strong enough to wipe them out. They had to get back to Plymouth as soon as possible. Once they got back to Plymouth, Bradford sent Squanto and Tokamahaman to Namaskit to find out what was going on. The next day, one of Massasoit's warriors, a man named Habamok, arrived at Plymouth, gasping for breath and covered in sweat. He had just run the 15 miles from Namaskit, where he'd last seen Squanto held by a warrior with a knife to his chest. Corbettant viewed Squanto as the instigator of Massasoit's shift toward the English, and he was the best translator that the English had. Corbitant was a lesser sachem who had previously been allied with Massasoit, but who opposed the leader's treaty with the English. Corbitant wanted to convince the Poconokets to follow him instead of Massasoit. Standish went to Namaskit to avenge Squanta's death if they found out that he'd been killed. And to make a show of English strength, as well as the fact that the English would defend their allies. If Squanto had been killed, Standish planned to behead Corbitant and display his head publicly in Plymouth. He took Habamok, who had quickly become his closest friend, as well as a couple of Englishmen. They didn't have any military experience, but Standish gave them a pep talk and then instructed them to shoot any Indians who attempted to escape. Standish and Habamok burst into Namaskit that night. It was raining, it was dark, and no one could see much of anything. Habamok interpreted while Standish demanded to know where Corbitant was, but the town's residents were too terror-stricken to speak, and some panicked and fled. The guards started shooting off their muskets, and several women clung to Habamok, calling him friend. They didn't find Corbitant, the chaos ended, and they learned that no one actually knew where Corbitant was. They did find Squanto, still alive though, as well as Toka Mohammed. They stayed in Namaskit that night, and the next morning, Standish told the residents of Namaskit that they shouldn't shield Corbitant if he continued threatening the English. They treated the people that they'd injured in the melee and returned to Plymouth. By the time they got home, Massasoit was already back in his village, likely having been released before the confrontation. 
It seemed that the show of force earned the pilgrims some respect, though, and several petty sachems sent messages to Bradford. Ipanau made new overtures of friendship, and even Corvatan sent a message saying that he wanted peace. A much firmer peace now existed in the region, and on September 13th, nine sachems, including Corvatan, Ipanau, and Canacum, went to Plymouth to sign a treaty professing their loyalty to King James. The Massachusetts had now threatened the Poconocets, though, so Bradford sent an exploratory expedition north to what's now Boston Harbor. They immediately noted what a perfect settlement location it was, and in fact, one of the Mayflower sailors had mentioned it as a potential site, and they could see why. There were three navigable rivers, an easily defensible neck of high ground, there was access to the fur-rich interior of New England, and a shore where ships of any side could go right up to the land. But it would be more work than it was worth to move now, and there were no Indians around, so they returned home. When they returned to Plymouth, they had finished their first harvest, and migrating birds filled the air. Massasoit brought a hundred people to Plymouth with five freshly killed deer. For three days, the two groups cooked on spits, and stews were filled with meat and vegetables. There were birds, likely turkeys and ducks, deer, lobster, and possibly fish. It was also possible to brew beer, so they ate, socialized, and reflected on the year that they'd just experienced. For Puritans, Thanksgiving meant a day of fasting and prayer, but this was the celebration we refer to when we talk about the first Thanksgiving. And the pilgrims certainly had a lot to be thankful for. After 11 months in the New World, they could grow crops and had a close friendship with some locals as well as peace with others. And Massasoit himself had a lot to celebrate. He was surging in influence and power thanks to his alliance with the English. At this point, his people could rival the Narragansetts in power, though not in population. And Squanto? Squanto was the man on whom everyone had come to depend especially the Pilgrims, and especially Bradford, which put him well on the way to being the most powerful Indian leader in New England. Thanks for listening. If you have any opinions, thoughts, or theories about anything we've discussed in the show, I'd love to hear from you either on Facebook or Twitter, and you can find those links at the website AmericanHistoryPodcast.net, as well as links to first-hand accounts and things. See you next week.